former President Donald Trump addressed United Auto Workers in Michigan last night at non-union factory Drake Enterprises, an audience that, according to NBC News, only included a few of the striking workers. His speech made multiple crooked Joe Biden jabs, including at the current president's electric vehicle mandate and the impact it will have on auto manufacturing in the United States. Under crooked Joe Biden, you have none of this. You have none of the things we want. Instead of economic nationalism, you have ultra-left-wing globalism. They hate our country. And the workers of America are getting put it very nicely, screwed, you're getting screwed. Yesterday, Joe Biden came to Michigan to pose for photos at the picket line. But it's his policies that send Michigan auto workers to the unemployment line. He only came after I announced that I would be here, you know, he announced quite a bit later. Spoke for a few seconds, did you notice he spoke for what, a few seconds? And he had absolutely no idea what he was saying. Biden's cruel and ridiculous electrical. Think of this. He wants electric vehicle mandates that will spell the death of the U.S. auto industry. You know the former president also called on the auto workers to endorse him in 2024. But we will stop him. Hopefully your leaders at United Auto Workers will endorse Donald Trump. According to the Detroit News, about 400 to 500 Trump supporters were inside the facility for the speech, but it was not clear how many auto workers were inside for the speech. One individual in the crowd who held a sign that said union members for Trump reportedly acknowledged that she was not a union member when approached by a Detroit News reporter after the event. Also, according to Detroit News, another person with a sign that read auto workers for Trump said that he was not an auto worker. Friend of the show, Bacha Ungar Sungar, wrote on X last night, Trump is currently laying out an entire economic agenda to protect and elevate working class jobs and wages in Michigan. It's exactly what you're not going to hear from the GOP primary candidates in their second debate tonight, which is the obvious reason he's ahead by 30 points. All due respect to Bhatia, I, I didn't hear an agenda uh, for working people. And I think the fact that nobody who, I won't say nobody, because I wasn't in the room, it seems from reporting that very few, if any, people who are either auto workers or union workers were even present for his talk, which I think speaks volumes, right? Say what you will about Joe Biden. He was invited there by the UAW workers. And say what you want about whether he did this knowingly <laughs> and was cognitively <laughs> present or if it was just a gaffe. <laughs> but when asked whether or not he supports 40 percent wages for those workers, he said yes. So even if it's performative, even if I do not believe he is the most pro-union president of our lifetime or in history or whatever crazy claim he's been making, that is a substantive commitment to giving the workers what they've been fighting for. Donald Trump is on record of, as saying a number of anti-union statements, both as he's running now and during his pre previous campaigns. As president, I read off a whole list yesterday, I won't do it again on the show, of all of the anti-union policies that he put into effect as president. And I think what we're really seeing now is that when you have a real labor action with people who have been organized in the context of a union and th at their workforce for real concrete material gains, it is very difficult to use culture wars or rhetoric to distract them from the reality that they have agreed on fighting for certain commitments that someone like Donald Trump simply has not followed through on. Yeah, and look, I think Trump is right on the electric vehicle mandate, and the union president, Sean Fain, basically had copped to that fact, right? He said that does bother the workers because they see that it requires less labor to make EVs. The most expensive part, the batteries, are made overseas. That's not good for the longevity of the industry. But you're right. It's not addressing the core issue of the workers want to be paid more money now, and they deserve to be paid more money. Um, you know, what percentage is correct, I think we'd probably disagree on. I'm probably more in, like, the 25 to 30 percent range, but they haven't had a real wage increase since 2008 and probably even sooner. So, like, yeah, stand with the workers. And none yeah. of the Republicans, including Trump, would say that. And by the way, one of the best parts of Trump's platform in his 2015 to 2016 campaign was reshoring manufacturing, mm -hmm. was made in America, mm -hmm. making sure that quality automobiles can be made at cost in the United States and, and that these auto companies can be more profitable. 
And no, nobody talked about reshoring. I think DeSantis said the word reshoring once during the debate mm -hmm. last night, and it was on an entirely separate question related to China, which is fine, but it wasn't about protecting the dignity of American union workers. And so I think every single GOP member completely missed on this issue. And it was so frustrating to me because Trump got it in 2016. At least he pretended to get it. Exactly. And now he's run completely in the opposite direction. Exactly. I mean, I think it's harder for him to do that kind of, um, I'm a union guy cosplay once he's actually been president for four years and has a record to run on. And there was a really interesting dynamic that emerged at the debate. The first question off the top was about the UAW strikers, a question to Tim Scott about a statement that he had made and got a lot of blowback for where he said, Ronald Reagan gave us a great example when federal employees decided they were going to strike. He said, you strike, you're fired, simple concept to me. He was asked off the bat, you think that striking employees should be fired? And he dodged and prevaricated and said, oh, well, I don't have the capacity as president to uh, sh fire non-federal employees, so it's a kind of a moot point. Then why bring it up in the first place? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and what, what really goes unsaid in the debate is that so many of the people on the stage are governors of southern states where they are performing the role of a kind of a mini domestic China, where they have these right-to-work laws that prevent unionizing and make it dip more difficult for workers to get the kinds of advantages in terms of wages that they have in northern states that don't have these right-to-work laws. And that is why so many companies exploit that reality and move companies to the South. Now, they claim it's good for people in the South. They get jobs. They, they, get, they attract industry to their states. But the people who are profiting from them, hand over fist, are the heads of those corporations who then give buku dollars to the governors for enacting those kinds of policies, while well, the people in those states have to live at substandard conditions and the people in other parts of the country. And this was really put on display, how the policies, certain conservative policies, disadvantage poor and working people. When Ron DeSantis was asked pointedly why it is that he has an uninsurance rate in Florida that is significantly higher than the national average. When he was first asked the question, he dodged and started talking about God knows what. <laughs> the, the moderators, I got to give them some credit. They, they, did, they did try. Yeah. Dana Refocus Perino especially, I think, performed really well. Yeah. Re, re, I don't remember who specifically was asking this one. It was late. I think it, I think it was Dana. <laughs> it was Dana? Okay. Reformulated the question, and he eventually just admitted that, well, we didn't expand Medicaid. Well, we don't have social services here, so that means more people are unemployed. Now, you can be a traditional small government conservative and say, <clears throat> it's good that we don't have the social safety net, and if people are unemployed, they got to deal with it. <laughs> but to many people listening to that, they say, oh my God, so if I get sick, if I get cancer, I'm a working person, I have a family. If I live in Florida, if I live in Ron DeSantis' America, that means I'm just on my own. And I think that's what started to rub people the wrong way about Ron DeSantis, is that once he gets on the national stage, it becomes clear that he's really not the populist Republican that he wanted people to believe he was, mm -hmm. right? Because when he's governor of Florida, he focuses pretty exclusively on cultural issues. Mm -hmm. People are excited that he's a cultural social conservative. But then you start digging into him on economics, and even on the Ukraine question early mm -hmm. on, he didn't really have you know, what what his stance was going to be on that. And you're like, oh, wait, he actually is still kind of that Tea Party guy that he was when he was in Congress. Mm -hmm. And it's people don't really like that. I mean, and I think it's important to mention that the people who are in these debate audiences are not the base of the party, mm -hmm. right? These are people who are consultants, they're donors, they're people who work in the party apparatus. And so they have a fundamentally different view of who is performing well, of what the big issues are, of what the proper stances are. So you can't judge based on who was clapping for right. certain canned lines. Um, you can't compare that to what the party and the American people actually want. Absolutely. That's such an important point. All right. Um, we're going to move on to some other topics now, but please do stick around. It's a great show today and more rising for you right after this.